this meeting is being recorded. All right, so welcome to equitable grading, reducing bias and increasing um, student success. success. So this workshop um, highlighted three essential pillars uh, for equitable grading, and they are accurate, bias resistant, and motivational. So the pillars are taken from a book called Grading for Equity. And if you're interested in uh, reading it, we have the book here at the center, a side all uh, for you to loan. Um, it's a book by Joe Feldman. And I, ha I have been teaching chemistry for more than a decade, both here at NIU and at other institution. And um, my class vary in size from six to 200 students. And so since I started teaching at NIU in 2016, I have interact with a lot of students, like thousands of students, um, because I'm responsible for teaching the gateway course. Um, it's a general education chemistry course. And for my interaction with the student here at NIU, I've learned a lot about the, our student, the, the background and experiences that they have, and I will share some of that lesson with you today. Um, and I have heard a lot of heartbreaking story from students over the years. Um, our students are very diverse, and if you knew, you're going to soon find out. So they have different starting point, and they, have, they face different challenges, um, and they do not all come with the same social capital or, or, or opportunity for development. So um, I can give you some number. For example, our graduation rate is about 45 to 46%. And this rate is even lower for Black students. Um, they are at about 30% while um, white students have a graduation rate of about 60%. Now, there also been a demographic shift so like about 10 years ago, the majority of the student body would be white student. But um, last fall, when the student statistic come out, 70% of our student now identify a student of color. So now being white on NI on NIU campus now suddenly become a minority. So that's something for you um, to consider as we go through this discussion. I hope the thought-provoking ideas that I share today will spark um, transformation in your way of grading and um, ultimately benefiting the growth and success of our student. So a little bit about me. My name is Lynn Nguyen. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, her. I am an inclusive teaching coordinator at the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. We call it CIDO for short. And although I'm very new to the professional development and educational development field, I am an award-winning educator with over a decade of teaching experience in higher education. I have a PhD in chemistry um, from Duquesne University and a master of science from the University of Oklahoma. Um, so yeah, welcome. All right, so uh, we have, very small crowd, and Richard, you already share a little bit about yourself. You from psychology, um, and uh, yeah, I did you say what you hope to take away today? You just want to learn a lot. Um, I want to learn everything, but I think a uh, couple of things that I want to. Well, first, I want to just uh, establish base, uh, touch base, and establish ground, and and uh, really tap into this resource that Andy has given us, and then I think yeah. Uh, one of, I'm sure you know this too, is uh, when it comes to getting a PhD and doing research, you're really, really good at your one specific research topic. And uh, then they throw you into university classes and they say, okay, go ahead and teach that about a broad skills of things and abroad topics. And so um, I want to be the best professor I can be and I think tapping into these resources and also like not realizing yeah there is teaching bias and there's grading bias and stuff that like it's bias for a reason that maybe I don't know about um and maybe it's just the way that it's like I you know I've been taught and the, the way that you know what I think is a, you know a grading style maybe not be the actual best grading style for the student because at the end of the day it's for the student right it's for um I want to make sure that, yes, you know, I want to get tenure. That's great and everything. But also like one third of my whole uh, 
job here at NIU is to be a professor and be a good one and not just go through the motions. So yeah, I think to word vomit all that, yeah, I just want to learn the effective ways of being a great teacher. And, uh, and this includes grading and uh, grading biases. Yeah. Is this your first um, position? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Congratulations. Thank you. And, thank you. Um, it's super exciting to have you join us. I know that there's a heavy research focus in a lot of higher education institutions, but I can assure you here at NIU, especially with our new provost, um, she, she, she was the interim provost and she officially become our provost just like a few months ago. And she come from the College of Education. So mm -hmm. her focus, like she made teaching her priority. So I think you're at the right place. And um, yeah, that's, that's a great. So I'm going to skip that. So here's a, a few things that I want to um, discuss today. So one of the things are um, aligning your grading with your teaching philosophy. And we, we spent some time discussing how your background experiences as well as identity shape your teaching philosophy. Um, and then um, I also hope that you, after this workshop, you should be able to identify and implement some of the growth focus practices that we discussed to create a more equitable grading system in our course. And my office like it's going to go off <laughs> when no movements. Um, so um, my, I have my dog here too. So if she barks, just <laughs> on it, I'm sorry. Okay. No, that's fine. Um, and then how can we best measure the student acquire knowledge and skill and not just their compliance? So this is the discussion that we have in the STEM field because I taught chemistry and um, it's this this we have to there's a line but where do you draw the line so that you can hold the student accountable for their action or inaction but at the same time are we really measuring their acquired knowledge content knowledge and skill or are we just uh, asserting authority and measure their compliance so that's something that we will talk about um and um uh, let's see so I think um, if you don't mind sharing, knowing that this video is being recorded and it uh, may be beneficial to some other faculty who watch it later, do you have an experience with a teacher that kind of chain or shape your life that you can share? Yeah, yeah. So I thought about this on the drive over here of like, what is the characteristics of a great teacher? And so um, in graduate school, I took a systems neuroscience course at University of Texas at El Paso is where I got my PhD at. And uh, the professor there, it, it um, he he lectured in a way where he was talking with you and not to you, if that makes sense. Where uh, it felt conversational and it felt like very in depth knowledge. If there's questions asked, it wouldn't be just like, okay, let me answer this question to get over it, or let me like grade this test to get over it. But like, let me ask you questions and let uh, let me respond to those questions in a very, I don't know fun matter where I didn't feel like oh like I'm, I'm I, I if I say a dumb or if I if you ask a question to the class and I get it wrong he's not like that's wrong and then I'm like okay I'm never gonna speak again so I think yeah it was very conversational but also like I, I maybe it's just I, I liked I like neuroscience so like it was like really really cool to me but he would bring in a lot of uh the idea of like let's let's kind of have fun talking about this stuff like I know I'm getting paid to be your professor and I know uh, there's like 80 of you guys and I probably won't remember your name, but uh, for this 50 minute course, let's have some fun and talk about the the subject that we all kind of like. So, yeah, that's great. And I have a feeling that you're going to be that professor, too. <laughs> I which hope is so. Gonna be great. <laughs> <I> hope so. <laughs> um, we have a lot of psychology majors, just so you know, so you potentially could influence and impact a lot of uh, mm -hmm. lives. So, um. So this is something that I like to present to people to, in a way of like, have you thought about your teaching philosophy? Have you developed one or are you in the process of composing and developing your own teaching philosophy? So there's a different way people view knowledge, right? So a long time ago, um, philosopher and educator Paulo Fear famously described knowledge as a gift bestowed on those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those who they consider know nothing. Um, so that one way of looking at it. And to this day, 2024, we still have faculty who consider 
this to be their teaching philosophy. Now, um, in contrast, in feminine pedagogies, their in their rejection of traditional view of teaching and learning as a one-way process. Uh, they emphasize inclusivity, just similar to the way that you describe your professor. So they recognize knowledge is socially produced and view teaching and learning as a more complex social process involve interaction, collaboration, negotiation. So um, this pedagogy strive to include students in the knowledge community rather than place the student outside of it. Um, so student and teacher ideally will learn with and form one another and co-constructing knowledge. Um, so the I think the wording put a lot of people off because it's called feminist pedagogy, but um, some historical contact to that feminist pedagogy is worth from um, uh, in the 1970s. I don't know if you're aware of this uh, study um, by William Perry. Um, are I, you? I'm not, I'm not. So he basically studied the form of, of um, intellectual ethical development in a college student. But then he studied a sample of 100 Harvard men. And then he concluded that this is the uh, development of college student. And so in response to that study, a group of women, of course, um, they published a book in 1986 and they call it the the woman ways of knowing, and that's where feminist pedagogy rooted in. So that study just basically um, study women, add more data into the picture on the way of learning. And so they they study and recorded that why women value academic work traditionally as associated with masculine and um, rational discipline. They also value experience, um, experiences, uh, social identity relationship. Um, so recognizing diverse experiences in the feminist pedagogies is crucial. It make each individual feel understood, respected for their unique perspective and contribution. All right, so one step toward making your grading system more equitable is to align your grading system with your teaching philosophy. So some questions you might want to consider when you're aligning your grading system with your teaching philosophy are what do you want your grades to represent? Uh, do you want grades represent student acquisition of learning objective or do they represent student compliance? Um, other question to think is, what do you want the grade to accomplish for you? Uh, do you want it to inform your instructional design or inform your feeling? And then the next thing is, what do you want the grade to accomplish for your student? Do you want it to incentivize the student learning, motivate the student to learn, or incentivize compliance? Um, and so, to think about what are the most important things you want your grade to represent for you, for your student. And then um, do you believe in assessing grade penalty for late work? Uh, why or why not? And uh, how does that affect equity in your grading practice? Um, and generally, you will be the one who know your course the best and you be the one who know your student the best. And, and um, I mean, it's a learning process. People keep thinking that like we know everything, but we don't. So uh, you make your decision. Um, you can only read the student evaluation every semester and improve next year. But these are just some starting point. Uh, all right, so here I have, um, a, 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 oops, why is it moving so fast? A collard or images and each of the images it represents something that a student had told me um, and that because my class were capped at 200 students uh, per section it's a uh, general education and it's a gateway course so many major like nursing major have to take that course as their the one um, chemistry course and so um 
think about the assumption that we make when students don't show up, right? And what is the reality? How can you find out? Um, will the student tell you? Um, so the pictures in this color, this big thing that my student have told me, so medical emergency, death of a loved one, court order, unexpected change in work schedule, um, issue with law enforcement, uh, breakup, divorce, mental health. This is like the young age um, where a lot of that could be very um, desperate and, and, and heartbreaking for them. So I, I changed over the years. So in the past, I used to require proof of whatever they're saying and then put them through uh, an ordeal of acquiring proof. Um, and most of them provided it. But then over the year, I stop. I and that's just my personal. I just stop requiring them to provide the evidence of their unfortunate circumstances, and and I just try to help and ask how can I help them. Uh, and and you, I think, as faculty, we have to earn the student trust as well, because when they trust us, they open more and and they tell more. Um, share more of their story. So just a few things that have that student have told me. So I have a student. Um, her brother was in prison. Um, she he had a child, and then the mother of the child uh, just died. So at eighteen years old, now she become a primary caregiver of a toddler, and so um, she was behind in class, attending it and completing classwork. And what I do was I routinely reach out to people that just kind of disappear, and I say, "What happened?" I was like, "What's wrong with you?" But it's like, "What happened to you?" And so when I find out about her situation, I put her in touch with the family coordinator at the NIU Child Care Center so that she can set up child care. And NIU have a support where students can get waiver. So I don't know if you have children, if you have to look for child care, but NIU have a an excellent child development and family center that staff, faculty, and student can use. And then I also have student who who was a veteran, but then because he non traditional, he older, he also a primary caregiver of his father who suddenly diagnosed with brain cancer, and he's very responsible student until he just disappear. And that's when I reach out and I say, what's wrong? But then also because of his military training and his identity as a white man, um, he didn't want to ask for help. So I have to say, can I help? I have to provide that. And that's when he opened up. And all of these students successfully finished the course and, and move on with their career. Um, so these are just some example of students with different racial, social background. They face different challenges. Um, but then when I make my grading policy and practices more equitable, they both succeed. It helped both of them. So... Um, I don't know if you plan to grade attendant, um, but uh, but you could you I suggest that you consider some question like what do you want your attendant grade to represent? Do you want the attendant grade to represent student acquired acquisition of the content knowledge or student compliant? Um, have you thought about it? Like how large is your class, and are you gonna take attendance? My class is a little over 40, and I was thinking for all the classes that, well, I mean, I had a mixture of attendance and not, like where what's required and wasn't required. I, I, I'm i not going to make mine uh, required, but what I might do is have once in a while, um, not pop quizzes, like, you know, I will tell them the lecture before, hey, but, you know, there's going to be a quiz at the beginning of next class. Um, and it's going to be not the hardest, but more an example of like what maybe some of the test questions of the previous lecture may be. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be like my kind of informal way of getting attendance, but also a knowledge check on quizzes, which uh, the grade, the grade value is very low. Like it's it, it, like it, it won't it won't fail them if they if they, you know, do horrible. Um, but uh, just a way where I can kind of monitor and like, like you said, like keep an eye on maybe students who just aren't attending. Mm -hmm. and maybe I can reach out and say, is I, I like your idea of like compassionate way of taking attendance where it's like, all right, what's, what's yeah. going on? Why aren't you here? So what, what do you think about that? Is that, is that a good way to do it?
so it depends yeah it's one of the good way right so um something you might want to uh also consider is um do you require a lot of debate or discussion um engage active and engaged learning in your course because i have faculty who take attendance and grade it because she teaching a debate course so they have to show up because she say that when you do debate on zoom there's a lot of nonverbal skill that you don't pick up on so she it's entirely up to the professor and the course it just be mindful of what you want the attendant grade to represent that's all um and during the pandemic the way we interact and the way we teach and learn had changed drastically right you're attending this workshop from naperville and i'm doing this in my office on campus so um i don't know it's it's a really tough choice but you already thought about how you could compensate for the people who might miss um i even consider if you if you plan to have a series of pop quizzes throughout the semester maybe consider drop one lowest one that way if somebody like miss one you say like, eh, that's your drop one make sure you don't miss the next one yeah i really want to make these these quizzes low 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 value ones just so uh, it's more for them to get some sample like okay this is what the questions that might be on the test or the structure of it or even being like hey there's a figure that i want you to know like five parts of it um, label it and then from then I can ask questions about that figure in the actual test and so there's like strategies I'm trying to work around it mm -hmm. that being said I mean it's my first semester so all this planning might just go out the out the door once I panic a little bit and which is why I'm here I guess to, to learn how yeah but um, you know I think it's brilliant because what you giving a, a formative assessment you give an assessment because you want to give student feedback and want to give them that hey this is what some of the test question might look like. So I think um, be transparent in your communication with students, tell them exactly what you just told me. And I think they would appreciate that. Um, I think it's a really good strategy. All right, so, so I I put this out there, but I don't think I need to um, talk much about this with you, but I just, Thing I want what I want to point out is the the first comment that you saw is the kind of comment that I received. That's a kind of traditional feedback that I received when I were in college um, twenty years ago, uh, and I didn't grow up in America, so I came to the U.S. as an immigrant and I learned English as an adult. So I was not stupid, but I didn't have a lot of the English de development that, that I needed to, to succeed in college. So when I was disappointed with my test grade and reach out to a professor for help, I usually um, get the feedback that I need to study harder. I need to come to class people here. And I said, but I did all of those. I'm still struggle. But um. These days, I think educational, especially the, the mindset chain and shift a little bit. We want to be more growth focused. There's a push toward that. And so um, I did give an example that Google Bard now become Google Gemini. The, the default feedback would be very growth focused. It would be very like fostering growth. Um, so I, I just thought that if we can't keep up with um, AI, we're going to be behind. So um, I just thought that this is interesting. I did a little test with AI, and you probably should too, because there's a lot of AI generative um, tool out there. And I don't think we can stop students from using it. Um, so that's what the reason I play with it. So I want to see what kind of biases um, AI have out there. Um, all right, so let's see, from your experience, um, do you mind sh sharing with me a little bit about, um, were you, um, the first generation going to college or no? I was the first per uh, person in my family to go to grad school. Um, oh, okay. My parents, my dad did not go, he did not get a high school degree. My mom was an elementary teacher. And so for us it wasn't even an option like we needed to go to college the uh, the the idea was okay what 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 degree are you going to get and so um, I, we were stressed uh, education can unlock a lot of doors um 
that my my dad was a truck driver could not go to some places and i'm you know that i as a phd i can i guess so i talked to some people and so um yeah and then growing up as a in the border the west texas border between mexico and the um, united states and then texas um i did witness a lot of first generation students and worked with first generation students where some of them literally needed a ride after experiments to the bridge to um to go across to Juarez, Mexico. So, uh, a lot of firsts in in my life. <laughs> yeah. So you, I'm glad you share that, and I hope you um, if you feel like it, you should share a little bit of your identity and experience with your student. Because I think when I first started um teaching ten years ago, it was like you only the professor you remove all the other identity and leave it outside the classroom but i can't do that anymore because i have young children so like uh, like when my child is sick i have to tell my student that hey my phone gonna be on today because i'm waiting for the doctor to call because my child is sick and when i disclose a little bit of my other identity as a working mother suddenly my the parents the student who also parent they feel um, easier when they reach out and say that, hey, my kid don't have school today. Can I bring her to class? And I say, yes. And you know what? If you like, you and her can sit up front. And, and then I did something fun, interactive that day for the kid um, while still teaching the content knowledge. So it's good. It's good to, to be aware of all those. So uh, the next thing that I want to discuss is uh, the growth focus um, grading practices that I hope you consider when you implement um, your grading practices. So the first thing is to align your assessment with the learning objective and grade by the learning objective. So I think as a faculty, you have a lot of academic freedom. You can set the learning goal and learning objective for your course. And um, when you align your assessment with the learning objective, it's a I think it's one of the most fair way to measure student, student acquiring of the course um, objective or standard um, rather than just giving them points for a complete assignment. And I think that because um, sometime, um, some people, uh, because of lack of experience on or what not, they, they don't distinguish homework and busy work. So busy work is one thing, but then do those busy work help the student learn the learning objective, right? So homework, if you were intentional about the assessment that helps students eventually acquire their learning objective, it's good. But then if it's a busy work, that is not so good because it would benefit students who don't have to work outside of class, students who have... Um, enough financial support that they should go to school and don't have to work. We have a lot of students who have to work and I will one of them. I work full time the first two years of college and then in my junior year, it get harder. So I work part time, but I always have to work because my family didn't have money to support me financially. So I always have to work throughout um, undergraduate school. So uh, yeah, just be intentional about your homework and uh, communicate with your student why you want them to do what you want them to do and how the activity or exercises um, will help them acquire and retain the, the learning objective. Uh, so extra credit, extra credit is a hard one. Um, I try everything I did. I give extra credit and then I don't give extra credit. And recently I tried some, I, I read about something that I thought really interesting and that was to um, separate your your point from like the knowledge that you want the student to acquire. And then the other one is like labor base. If they do a little bit extra, then they can get those extra credits. So maybe put the extra credit in the labor base, the, the civic learning, civic engagement. Um, and so separate that from the learning objective based activity. Um, so in your experience, like, do you, you receive extra credit in college? Do you like it? Are you thinking about giving it? It It's a, it's a slippery slope. Yes. Um, once you let one extra to go, then 
I'm sure like as a when I TA'd in uh in grad school and I'm sure you get it now where it's the it's the mythical essay or myth mythical paper where if they miss like two thirds of the course, can I write an essay that will make up for all of it? And you're like, no. And then it's kind of weird because you have to say like, if I do this for you, then I have to do this for everyone else. Like it, it, there's an equity there. And so with extra yes. credit, um, it uh, it's a little bit iffy because uh, that can go into a lot of things. And like, even, even then like what you're saying, like if it's labor intensive, like what about the students who don't have the time to do that, that I'm punishing them for not maybe drawing a diagram yeah. that I need or, so it's, uh, I don't know, it's slippery slope. I, I I like the syllabus way where I show them, this is all that you're going to get. These are the points that you're going to get. Um, now you're, well, what you're saying earlier, where I can have quizzes and the last quiz will be dropped. So don't worry if you, if you do a bad one and maybe the tests, like, I, I don't know, I'm still not convinced about a curve for tests, but, uh, stuff like that like i don't know extra credit i don't know what do you think <laughs> yeah so um curve for tests is it's very normal when i were attending college um 20 years ago but they say people start to think that maybe you want to rethink that um and more like uh, receive feedback and maybe allow retake maybe allow multiple chain because like some student was like if this if these are the learning objectives you want them to learn and then they fail the test so they show that they have not learned the learning objective and then if you just move on and then what? So you haven't yeah. teach the learning objective and the student just like, okay, I don't have a chance to relearn then they just move on. So by the end of the semester, did they really learn all the learning objective that you want them to learn? So that's something for you to consider. I let my student retake their homework. Um, and I, because my chemistry homework, I use a, an online homework software where they can generate with different numbers. So it's the same learning objective, but the question slightly different. And so the student, at first I limited them to three attempt, and then eventually I just said, you know what, <laughs> if you keep hammering at it, if you come to me for help, um, within a period of time, so I have, um, deadline i say that they can do it a limited time and then it's the system i set it up so that it only recorded the highest score so that's something that i could do with my own course but for other people i don't know maybe you should consider letting them retake and um like if they retake it and they get a C or something to be fair to the other student, but yeah. uh, do they have a chance? Yeah. What I might do is like, yeah, like with the quizzes, I'll solve, because like I'm as a new hire and first semester teaching, I'm all over the place, but I do want to make sure that I err towards giving the students a chance versus like, hey, you failed. Sorry, you failed. Yeah. And so um, I like the idea of maybe because I, I want to do these like kind of not pop quizzes, but like, you know, review like lecture review quizzes and have them be low stakes and last last grade will be dropped but then also maybe right include uh 10 to five attempts and so you can get the real hang of like what these questions are maybe you can get a a bigger bite of the test bank apple so you know okay like this is what he's going to teach on this is what his tests are on so I, I like that idea yeah and um i mean that's a lot and I'm I'm not here to tell you how to teach psychology because I don't know. I only um, know how to teach. I, I, I'm I'm here to learn. Like you're passing wisdom to me. Like I <laughs> I will I will take that. Yeah. So um other thing um uh so participation. Some some faculty evaluate and assess student participation. Um and it's great. Like I say, if it's a debate class where you teach them how to debate, then uh, participation is critical, uh, crucial. It's a skill that they need to learn for their career later. Um, however, it's important to be mindful of potential biases. Um, some students may find it difficult or uncomfortable to maintain eye contact, speak up, or, or take notes. Um, so we, so that's, um, and then multilingual learner of English too, because I were one of the students who said, I know the answer, but I don't want the kids to laugh at my accent. So I would not raise my hand and participate in class. But if I have a chance to like write down on a piece of notes and pass it to the professor, or if I discuss my idea in a smaller group, then I speak up. 
So if you do great participation, think about different ways, various ways that the student can participate. Um, another thing that we just mentioned was retake, resubmission, and revision. Um, so require retake if student earn below a certain grade because that would encourage student to continue to learn and and um, continue with the learning process rather than just accept a poor grade and move on. Um, so this is one possible strategy. And um, if the student fell below a certain level of mastery or do not demonstrate that the learning goal have been met, um, you can um, require them to take another look at the course material and, and retake the assessment. Um, and perhaps the new grade would re replace the old one to measure growth or, um, let's see, um, or, so one thing that people tend to do is average and uh, it's an easy way, right? You, you fail the test, and then you take, you learn, and then you um, you acquire that knowledge, that learning objective. So now we average it out. So it's it's something that in my field work we push back against it because it's depressed growth. So they didn't know it, they learn now they know it, and then you flatten it out by averaging it. So. Um, just something to consider. If you really want to promote growth, then you might want to allow the new grade to replace the old one instead of averaging. Um, so the last one, let's see, inclusive group work. So if you do group work, um, that's certain thing that you have to consider. Are you planning to do group work? Um, I'm not sure. This is where like I want to make contact because I think in a week from now, you'll be doing day one of teaching. Uh, or like the center will yeah. be doing so i'm gonna be on on that one too to to develop it so so far uh all all i really have right now is my grading structure and then the powerpoint slides but yeah. even then we could maybe offline or whatever talk about how the the book provides some very chunky powerpoint slides that may not be the best for students but uh, with inclusive work I'm i'm not too sure yet yeah, so it's something to consider because when these days, higher education educator are asked to do a lot. So besides teaching the student the, the subject expertise area, you also have to teach them um, translatable skill for the future workplace, right? So in group work, you will able to help them develop um, teamwork skill collaboration, communication, um, how they can hold each other accountable or uh, for their action or inaction. So I actually provide a separate workshop on inclusive group work, like how the team dynamic can really benefit student learning. At the same time, as faculty, you have to be very careful when you construct group assignment and, and have group work. Um, so um, that's something for you to consider if you find time. <laughs> I know you're gonna be super busy, but if you find some time, you could even go to our website or attend the next workshop on group, inclusive group work to learn more and make a decision whether you're gonna have group work or not. Um, but once again, to be fair and equitable, the group grade or, or the, the, the grade for the group assignment should reflect student learning. Um, and, and, and individual grades should be assigned for group work. So let's see. Um, the last thing is um, we want to value growth. Um, with our students come in with unique position in life and in academic um, achievement. And we want to value growth, but not, we don't, we don't want to value access or privilege. So I'm going to explain it a little bit more. So um, think about whether your grading practices inadvertently punish students with fewer resources. Um, so I, in my experience, I have students come from distress, distressed public school and they learn nothing about chemistry in their high school. Um, she literally told me everybody get a B and we didn't learn anything about chemistry. So these students, even though they're brilliant, but they need to put in more effort, more time um, and have to revise an ass assignment 
multiple time or take an exam multiple time before they master the course learning objective. Um, and then somebody might come into your course with more resources, more purpose preparation uh, from their prior, ed prior education experiences. So I uh, just, I guess, should be mindful of should the less prepared student who um, at the ends of the course have mastered the content, um, should they be punished by always having a lower grade than the more prepared student? Uh, who begin the course more prepared and have more knowledge because they have more resources in their high school. Um, so that's another pushback on averaging because averaging, it depressed growth. Um, how can we make it more equitable um, and dropping the lowest exam or not giving out zero for the grade is something to consider um, so that it's, it's promote growth and, and not um, depressing growth. One thing is we give our grade as A, B, C, D, F, right? So if you think about it, um, F is starting at 60%. So when you give out a zero grade and you're averaging out, it's really gonna hurt the student. Um, so that's uh, another separate uh, workshop there. <laughs> okay, so... Um, yeah, so these are some of the growth focus practices. Um, so I just want you to take a minute and, and think about these things. Um, and, and push back too, right? Because some people um, say that, what if I don't want to wait the more recent performance? Um, and so it depends on the situation. I would have a conversation with those faculty but these are some of the things that um, have been documented and studied that it would help um, mm -hmm. our grading practices to be more equitable. Yeah, I, I mean, I've just heard about this, but letting go of the, the, the zero grade, that's very, that's very interesting. That, uh, I don't know, that's pretty cool. <laughs> right, so like A at 90 and a both B eighty and above, C seventy and above, and then D sixty and above, and then when you give a zero grade, what letter is that? We don't even have a letter for it, right? So if the student fell, should they be failing at sixty percent? So it's just something that the the scientists and me, the medical, mathematically, it doesn't make sense to me when we give our zero like that. It depresses the student grade tremendously. So hmm. I think I just I would have to do the math behind like yes, the, the, please the, do. the grade weighting. I really like this idea. Um, where I guess where where could I get more resources about this? Because I'd love to just read it and maybe talk to the students about uh, about that. Yeah. So um, at the end of the slide, um, at the end of the presentation, I have a slide summarize all the resources that I use to compose this workshop. And like I say, I have the book here, and. When you are on campus, let me know. Let me see if you can yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, it's just in focus and now it's lost. There it is. Oh, I got it. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just called grading for equity. And it's a it's a good read. Like I don't agree with everything that um the author said because he's 30 um K to 12 student. But then at the same time, I a lot of the thought provoking practices make me think about um, how we can translate the practices into higher education. Yeah, I think uh, the, f um, the f first three, I, I think I wish I would have gotten that as <laughs> in grad school and undergrad. I think, yeah, because it, it allows the, it allows the student a chance to learn and not just like, okay, if you don't get this, you're already behind the eight ball, yeah. you're going to fail, retake it again. And it's yeah. not, it's not because then it punishes maybe students who don't have the time or mm -hmm. the resources to do it. And the the fourth one, it, it's interesting. I, I as a first semester teacher, I might have to uh, wait till third or fourth semester student or uh, teaching to do that because I'm just afraid I'll run out of time or I, I won't do it right. Or um, and then the, the I guess the same thing with the fifth one. Like I, I that's I guess this is why I'm here, right? Is to yeah. find ways to 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 expand the strategies for that. 
So the last two bullet point that you point out, fourth and fifth, I don't know if you heard of the word ungrading, but that's a movement that pushing toward ungrading. So instead of giving a grade, it just feedback. Now, I am also skeptical about that process because we have so many things in space that use a grade. So for college acceptance, for college scholarship, you need to have a grade, you need to have GPA. So this movement, it's, it's worth noticing that they want to do ungrading, but then systematically, we don't have the systematic chain for ungrading yet. Um, but the argument was formed like when in my child, she's gonna start kindergarten too, but when she in um, pre-K, she learned about um, the letter A, B, C, D. She, she doesn't receive a grade for knowing the letter or not knowing the letter, right? She received feedback. So if she didn't know the letter, she received feedback that, hey, you don't know this letter and let's work on it. And then when she, know all the letter and she receive feedback that, yay, you did it and then move up, but she doesn't get a grade. So only when we get into um, K to 12, that's when we start assigning grade. So the the idea behind it, which is like, can we go back to that in explain, expensive feedback so that the student learn the learning objective? But long story, we're not there yet, so <laughs> you good. <laughs> All right, so um, late assignment. So this is something um, you might want to consider to an equity-minded lens is your late work policy. So start thinking about what kind of policy you're gonna have for late assignment, if the student submits um, the assignment late. So um, again, what do you want the grade to represent? How well are your students learning um, or how well they comply with the rule? So what assumption do you make when students don't turn in uh, work on time? Uh, what the reality? And how do you find out? Um, what are the obstacles students facing? And do you trust them? I mean, do they trust you enough to tell you the truth? So, um, similar to what I said earlier, um, our students are very diverse and they have different challenges. So um, when I first got here, I was told by the people who did uh, the, she, the people who did the uh, lab coordinator uh, position, because the lab obviously a lot of students, and she did say that the students just, um, to want to get the grade without doing the work. Basically, the, the mindset or the culture is thinking students are lazy or unmotivated. And it's, it's influenced me because I'm the newbie and I was told this, so I believe her. But then it took time for me to realize that, no, that's not the case, at least not for my general chemistry course. Um, so I, I would encourage you to start thinking about um, some late policy do you accept late work um do you and here are some option for you to consider so mm -hmm. extension requests how can student request an extension uh, could you implement an online form to standardize the process uh, do students have to prove provide evidence that they need extension um, what equity issue might proof introduce um, and could the student instead be required to reflect on why they need an extension so they can determine whether is it in their power to solve the problems that might be getting in the way of their success. Um, late passes, could the student be given a certain number of late passes for an assignment in a semester? Um, in other words, um, can student turn in a certain number of assignment late within reasonable time frame? Um, and then floating deadlines. So it's also called flexible due date. This involves providing a range of due date for work. For example, you could offer a student incentive to turn in work early um, so that they can get more thorough and early feedback on an assignment or allowing resubmission with the revision for early submission. Uh, other thing is optional or self-selected homework. Um, 
to allow students to um, submit work in progress. That means they can submit assignments that aren't completely um, done uh, to see how the student, so that you can see how the student progressing. Um, you could have students provide you with links to work in progress so you can check their work before it's due and provide feedback uh, that might help them succeed. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, those are plenty for you to consider. <laughs> so what stick out, like what jump out for you? So I, I remember well, the same class where I had that amazing teacher with his assignments. It, it was kind of funny where we had like maybe like papers we had to write and submit by Sunday night. Right. And he always said, I'm not if I if it's 1201, I'm not going to punish you. Like, honestly, I'm not going to even read it because I'll be asleep by then. So like as long as you put it, you, you submit it before I make my coffee in the morning on Monday, then um will be fine. And he never actually put a date on it. He never put a specific time. So, and we don't know his coffee drinking habits. So we didn't know exactly that, but it kind of gave us a little bit of a, a relaxing, like, okay, like if it's 12, 1159, we don't have to, you know, put in a bad gray or a bad paper. If we can just maybe, uh, if we had another hour or two to do, then it would be better. And so I, I, I know with my first class, I, I, I can't be as vague because I'm not really doing any turning in assignments um, my first semester. But uh, uh, I'm, I don't know, it, it's funny when it comes to labor policies, because as a TA, I've been burned a couple of times where the student said, you know, he's sick. And then I saw him at, or his parents are sick in Chihuahua, Mexico, which is like three hours, four hours away from the university. And I see him at the gym that afternoon. And so I'm like, oh man, like you burned me a little bit, but I would rather be, kind i'd rather be that i don't know i'd rather be burned more than like the other way where it's like a person really had a problem and i wasn't empathetic enough to to see that and so um i don't know i, I still have to ponder these things i i like the ideas of uh the floating deadlines or maybe if i say okay with this quiz like you know one like the deadline will be this date but if 80% of the people have submitted by then, then I'll officially close it. So um, it can kind of vary based on like deadlines, yeah, but I don't know, yeah. I guess I won't be as strict unless they, like you said, with it, within reason, or if it's like, you know, quiz one and uh, they haven't taken it yet and it's already the final, then maybe uh, I had to close that. But yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I need to, I need to think about this. Yeah. So think about it. Cause what you describe your professor did sounded like floating deadline. Um, and you see the benefit to it, but you also were one of the very responsible students, right? So you did it, but then the other student, when you need to teach them responsibility and hold them accountable for their inaction, um, so it's it's a hard line. And another thing that if your class is small enough, 40 instead of 200, and if you want to, in the first day of class, maybe create a community guide community guideline so have some idea of what your late policy would be throw it to them and tell them that what do you think like like have a conversation and then when you agree the student work with you and agree on a late work policy then when they are late you can remind them hey we work about this policy we mentioned it on the first week of class and you guys agree to this that's it would be fair for everyone then they can't argue with that. So that's another way to um, consider. Um, and then we have a lot more. Um, effective communication, providing feedback, grading rubric. So all of these are good things. And we have separate workshop to cover them. So I will not um, cover them today. And um, yeah, so because we just have you, so we did a lot of reflection um, on the, the material that uh, I throw out there at you. And the last slide, this is the resources that I'm gonna send to you. I'm gonna give you the, um, the PowerPoint slides as well. And you will have my contact information and you can always reach out if you want to discuss more. Aside of we also provide one-on-one um, -on -one consulting. Um, so if you really want to sit down- I'm gonna bug you. I'm yeah. gonna, I, I, <laughs> I, I, it, I'm half, I'm a quarter confident and then at times maybe half confident that I want to be like, I'm going to be a great professor, but I think I just need to get over like the, the fear of 
teaching a semester, like a class for the first time that's not uh, in grad school or a postdoc. And so, yeah, I will definitely be using all these resources and yeah. talk, bugging you quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. And then when you build your course, we have a, an instructional designer team as well. So they can look at your Blackboard course and give you feedback as well. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just um, send an email to sidle at niu.edu and then a team member would be in touch and help you. And you're going to be great. I mean, I, this is really super hope, exciting. I really hope so. I like, I... I would love to give a chance for, I don't know, like I, I want, I want to just be a great professor. I mean, I want to, you know, obviously do well in research and get grants and money and everything like that. But I think I first learned about neuroscience and my passion through in a classroom. And I think like that the people who have invested time in making their slides and making great presentations and talks and classes have invested time of their life for me. And it would be a shame if I'm just like, Oh, like, let me, Mm -hmm. Let me just give the worst possible. I want to really, I really want to succeed and be a good, uh, I know, educator. <laughs> yes, that perfect. So I'm a, and I'm recording there. Uh, okay. Oh, whoops. Oh, yeah.